comments. It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Uh, it was very clear yesterday from the non-answers we heard from the government that neither of them, neither the Health Minister or the Premier, had any idea what was happening at Orange Air. We in the PC caucus didn't learn about Orange's plan to lease a helicopter from Augusta Westland through a Freedom of Inform Information request. We didn't learn about it from a whistleblower. We learned about it just through a search through a public website on the internet. So can the Premier explain how neither she or the Health Minister, the very people responsible for oversight of Orange, had no idea that Orange was planning to do business with the very same company being investigated by the OPP? Thank you, well, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care will want to speak to the details. And the, the Leader of the Opposition received a letter uh, uh, before the end of question period yesterday outlining what was, uh, what was happening, Mr. Speaker. Uh, obviously, as I said yesterday, Orange is well into a new chapter. The governance has been changed, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Orange has been working with uh, both with communities who are, who are supportive of the, the measure to lease an AW-139 aircraft to replace the SK-676 helicopters at its Musni base. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, what's really important is that despite what the member opposite is inferring, this, uh, this RFI is still open, Mr. Speaker. It continues to be open uh, from, co from companies uh, receiving from companies until March 29th. So, in fact, there have been no decisions made, Mr. Speaker, despite what the Leader of the Opposition implies. One I saw of a single source. Uh, uh, that'll, uh, that'll do. And I will deal with anyone that decides that that's funny. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. At the end of question period yesterday, the Health Minister gave me a copy of a letter dated February 10th of this year from Orange, uh, about Orange, from his de Assistant Deputy Minister, advising the Minister that it planned to lease a helicopter from Augusta Westland. So it's pretty obvious, Mr. Speaker, that the letter was only brought to the Minister's attention after I asked the question here in the Legislature about Orange's shady business deal. Mr. Speaker, isn't the Premier concerned that neither she or the Health Minister knew anything about Orange's sole source deal with Augusta Westland? Where is the oversight that this government promised? Or is this business as usual under the government of Kathleen Wynne? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, with these wild accusations, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I think we're finally beginning to see the true colours of the Leader of the Opposition and the smear campaign that he's trying to introduce here. Here is the truth, and what a difference a day makes, Mr. Speaker. As the Premier mentioned, this is, there are two Sikorsky, Sikorsky helicopters in Moosini that are reaching end of service. A decision was made after consultation by Orange to replace those Sikorskys with a leased AW Augusta Westland uh, uh, helicopter so that we would have a single fleet across the province, yeah, because there were better. challenges to getting pilots who were also trained on the Sikorskys, Mr. Speaker, right. and having a single fleet makes absolute sense. So an RFI, a request for information, was introduced in February, and despite what the member is inferring, the RFI continues to be open Answer. until the end of the month. In fact, I understand that several companies have expressed interest on the lease. And should there be an indication that a company or Thank companies— you. I'll continue in this. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. When a serious public policy question is asked, the government chooses to attack. And I, I will refer the Auditor General completed his 2012 report into Orange Air and said the scandal was a textbook example of what happens when a ministry fails to properly oversee a government agency. The Public Accounts Committee report said the ministry missed a number of red flags, just should have been alerted to bad things were happening at Orange. Mr. Speaker, getting a letter from Orange announcing that they're sole sourcing a contract from the very same company under a criminal investigation by the OPP should have raised one gigantic liberal red flag. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier explain, after seeing this letter, why they didn't cancel the shady contract? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. 
Thank you. Minister? Yes. Well, first of all, there is no contract, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. And as I was mentioning, should a company or companies express interest between now and the end of the, of the month, it will move forward to a request for proposals. And in the event of a request for proposals, an RFP, a fairness commissioner will oversee the process yeah. to ensure fairness and transparency. And I think I would hope this would make it abundantly clear to the opposition just how important and how proper this process is. And I know the member is concerned about the relationship with Augusta West Westland. And Augusta Westland is cooperating fully with the OPP on the investigation. But, however, Orange currently has a relationship with Augusta because for maintenance of the helicopters, for yeah. replacement of parts, yeah. they need to get them from the parent company. So what the, the, the leader of the opposition is suggesting, either entirely buying a new fleet, if he doesn't oh, want yeah, this, this, this Orange to have uh, a relationship with Augusta Westland for maintenance of the current helicopters, Answer. or he's talking about danger and the, the, to the pilots that have to to fly these if we're unable Thank to you. service them properly. Yeah. Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the CEO of Orange kept up his end of the bargain. He sent a letter to the health minister and told him that Orange was getting back into bed with Augusta Westland. He waved that big red flag. Question to the, the failure Premier. here is with Premier. the minister and the Premier. And my question is for the Premier. Yesterday, when I asked the Premier about the Orange's shady deal with Augusta Westland, she responded, I do not know the nature of this particular decision. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier explain why she knew nothing about such a controversial deal? Can the Premier tell us why she isn't doing her job to protect patients and taxpayers in the province of Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Mr. Speaker, I find this unbelievable. I would yeah. suggest that the leader of the party just understand that there's no way he's going to win this argument. When you look at the facts behind this, the wild allegations that he made yesterday, that he continues to make today, and he's besmirching the reputation of Orange, Mr. Speaker, including great individuals like Ian Delaney, like Charles Harnick, the former Attorney General of this province and a member of the Progressive Conservative Party. I can't believe that he continues. But to suggest, that, as the member opposite seems to be suggesting, that we cut off all business ties with Augusta Westland, that would require the purchase of an entirely new fleet, or alternatively, it would require putting our first responders and our patients, 18,000 patients a year, Mr. Speaker, putting them at risk by not properly servicing these aircraft. We don't have a contract for the lease of Mr. Augusta Westland. We have an RFI that may lead to an RFP, and a number of companies have expressed interest, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. What the government did. Uh, that's it. I'm going to go to the individual. I asked you to try to keep it calm. You're not. I'm going to deal with the individuals, even if you chirp something quick. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker. You know, we've obviously touched a nerve. The government got caught, and they got caught with the exposure of an advanced award contract notice. That is what we found, and that is what we're trying to expose. I do not understand why the government is doing business with a company under a criminal investigation here in the province of Ontario. But it gets worse, Mr. Speaker. This same company, Augusta Westland, the same company that whined and dined disgraced Orange CEO Chris Mazza, in October of 2014 got charged by the Indian government for shady deals. And actually, just more recently, Sweden, their anti-corruption authorities, launched an inquiry into the sole source purchase of Augusta Westland helicopters. There is criminal investigations into this company across the world, Thank and this you. government's doing business. Why are you doing business? For the Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Excuse me. Uh, I, I'm trying to get in, and I'll deal with it. But you're not helping me. The Minister of Energy will withdraw. Speaker. Minister of Health. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I understand that the member opposite is expressing concerns about a company that is fully cooperating with an OPP investigation, an investigation that centers on the previous administration a number of years ago at Orange. However, as I mentioned, and what the member opposite seems to be implying, I'm not prepared to abandon an entire fleet. We have to maintain a relationship with the parent company, with Augusta Westland, for spare parts for things like the gearbox of a helicopter, that what the member is suggesting is cutting off all ties with Augusta Westland, which, which is completely inappropriate and impractical because either we stop servicing these aircrafts, putting patients and pilots at risk, or we would have to spend millions and millions of dollars and purchase an entirely new fleet. That's completely inappropriate. But what is happening is Orange Answer. is cooperating with the OPP, the Ministry is cooperating with the OPP, Augusta Westland is cooperating with the OPP, and that will continue. Thank Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier, and I'm hoping rather than spin, we can get a serious answer to a serious question. This is a company that's being investigated worldwide, in Sweden, in Cyprus, in India, for trying to influence government for shady deals. For some reason, the Liberal government here in Ontario chooses to want to do business with them again, despite the fact the Auditor General said we don't need additional helicopters. If you do not want to answer on the question of protecting taxpayer dollars, how about we talk about patients, about the health concerns associated with these helicopters? The report from the Auditor General said there's not enough room to perform CPR. There's not enough room to lift patients' heads, forcing paramedics to insert a breathing tube. A July 2013 coroner's report said operational issues with these helicopters contributed to the death of eight patients. So my question for the Premier, and please don't pass question. the buck, Mr. Speaker, it's not right for patients, it's not right for taxpayers. Why are they doing business with a company that's being criminally investigated? Thank you. You see the please? You see the please? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I'll repeat that we have two aging Sikorsky, Sikorsky hot, uh, helicopters in Moosonee. They're nearing the end of their serviceable period. They need to be replaced. They're going to be yeah. replaced Maybe with what's most appropriate, them. another Augusta Westland, which will turn our fleet from having two different types of helicopters into a single fleet. It's much better for pilots. They support yeah. this. We don't have to be concerned about having pilots specifically trained for the Sikorsky and the challenges of getting pilots. Uh, on staff at Musini for that reason. It's better for reliability as well. We have an RFI which is open until the end of the month. There are a number of companies, including Augusta Westland's parent company, that has expressed interest in holding that lease. If there are, is a company or a number of companies that move forward with that RFI, we'll move to an RFP. We'll have a fairness commissioner who will oversee that entire process, Mr. Speaker. It will be consistent with the broader public sector and procurement sir. directive. This is as open and transparent as as it gets. The member opposite wants to actually dismantle the fleet, buy an entire new fleet, Thank and you. put patients and pilots at risk. Thank you. New question. The member from Bramley Gormald. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, did the Premier or her staff sign off on the budget before it was sent to the translators? Mr. Speaker, um, I, I'm, I want to uh, answer the question, but I just want to acknowledge what I think people are seeing on their, uh, on their social media, that uh, Rob Ford has died, and I just want to um, express the sadness of this legislature in that, and we'll, uh, we'll address, have a moment of silence at the end. I believe we're going to ask for a moment of silence at the end. Okay. Um, so. Mr. Speaker, um, in terms of the uh, the budget, I just want to I just want to make sure that the um, that the uh, member opposite understands that uh, we listen to people from around the province constantly. Uh, I travel the province. I, I hear from people year round. Um, the issues and the concerns that I hear and that we hear are uh, reflected in the decisions that we make and are reflected in our budget. On the specifics, in terms of. Uh, the, the timing. There were a number of uh, groups, for example, who appeared before the committee, Mr. Speaker, and their ideas are reflected in the budget. So I will come back to those in the uh, in the supplementary. But there was uh, there was a lot of um, a lot of information that flowed, Answer. Mr. Speaker, well after the uh, the translation had already been had been had begun. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, just before I ask my question, Mr. Speaker, I also want to acknowledge on behalf of New Democrats uh, the, the sadness and the loss uh, of, uh, 
of the death of Mr. Mr. Ford. Um, it, it's a tragic loss, so I just want to acknowledge that as well. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the budget was written and sent for translation on January 27th. That was before pre-budget consultations heard from the following. The Ontario Health Coalition, the Canadian Federation of Students, the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care, the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, the Registered Nurses, Nurses Practitioners and ONA. OPSU, the Toronto District Labour Council, the Ontario Hospital Association, the craft brewers and winemakers, the chiefs of Ontario, and fix our schools. Can the Premier explain why she went ahead with the budget before hearing from these Ontarians? Wow. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, it's completely false and untrue uh, what the member has just said. We had all, done all the consultations, all that was uh, achieved. We did over 20 of them. Uh, translations of portions of the budget are done continuously. The one that mattered most, Mr. Speaker, is what happened on Saturday, February 20th, the day that I sat in my office here in Toronto reviewing the budget, making amendments to it still. And that translation was what mattered. That was the final product. That what went to print and was produced here in the House on 25th of, Mar of February. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the Premier loves to talk about consultations and conversations, but that means listening as well as talking. But while people were presenting, the Liberal government had already written the budget, it was written. finalized it, and sent it for translation. Will the Premier apologize to Ontarians for treating their consultation as a PR exercise? Yeah, that's a good Mr. Speaker, the work that Scafia does, the work that all of us in this House do to consult with our constituents, to enable us to populate uh, the budget, the document, with priorities and responsibilities of the people of the province, that's critical. I sat on Scafia for many years. I recognize all too well why we should do it and need to do it. It is why I appeared before Scafia on the final uh, submissions of consultations. And I had the opportunity to express what the government wanted to do, to express and hear from both the NDP, the Liberals and the PCs on their reflections of those consultations. And the very people that the member opposite just cited are included in this budget, yeah. are cited in this budget. In fact, I can relate some of the very issues. Three million for the bioindustrial innovation of, of Canada, that's on page 10 in Hamilton. One million to the issue of pregnancy yes, and infant loss on page 115. That happened, Mr. Speaker, after those consultations. 17 million to the Toronto uh, Atmospheric Thank Fund you. on page 30th. Wow. Thank you. New question? The member for Bradley going home. The next question is again to the Premier. The Premier says she is a partner in the federal government. Does that mean the federal budget will ensure that Ontario will receive enough funding, infrastructure funding, so that the Premier can finally agree House to Leader. stop the sale of Hydro One? Thank you, Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I have no idea what is in the federal budget. We will all have to wait until this afternoon. I am hopeful, Mr. Speaker, I am hopeful now that we actually have a federal government that understands that investing in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, that working with provinces is important, that having a price on carbon is important, Mr. Speaker, that we have a federal government that is willing to work in partnership with, uh, with the provincial governments across the country. I'm hopeful, Mr. Speaker, that we will see those uh, things reflected in the budget. I'm very optimistic about that, but I don't know the specifics of the budget. We'll have to wait till this afternoon. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In the fall of 2014, Liberal MPPs supported a motion calling for national, universal, and affordable childcare. Unfortunately, there was nothing in this Ontario budget for childcare. Liberal MPPs made a promise here in the legislature to partner with the federal government so mothers and fathers can get the child care they, that they can afford and families would stop seeing cuts to child care across this province. Given that there was nothing in the Ontario budget for child care, has the Premier received any assurances from the federal government that they will pick up where the provincial budget failed and actually support affordable child care in Ontario? Wow. 
Thank you, Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, you know, again, I, I don't have uh, information about what is in the, uh, the federal budget. I know that we have a federal government uh, now, Mr. Speaker, that, unlike the previous federal government, actually shares a value system with, uh, with uh, our government, that understands that it's important to work with provincial governments, that it's important to invest in people and their talent and their skills, invest in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, and, and is willing to have those discussions that, uh, that the previous government wasn't willing to have. But, Mr. Speaker, I have no information about the specifics that are in the budget this afternoon. What I do know, Mr. Speaker, is that we have been working to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in child care. We have worked with the, the child care sector, Mr. Speaker. We're modernizing uh, the child care sector so that, so that we can assure safety and security for children yes, who are in child care places in, uh, in child care across the province. We'll continue to do that, Mr. Speaker, but we'll have to wait for the federal budget this afternoon. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. For years, the Liberals have insisted that all the problems came from Ottawa. Now they talk about the strength of their federal partnership. Does that mean that after this federal budget, they will stop closing demonstration schools, they will stop closing hospital beds, they'll stop firing nurses, and finally stop the sale of Hydro One? Good question. Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, you know we have uh, we have made investments in this province, and the uh, the member opposite talks about uh, the infrastructure investments. Well, he doesn't talk about the infrastructure investments. He talks about he talks about Hydro One, bit, but he doesn't support infrastructure investments. His party would somehow, um, out of old cloth, magical thinking, they would create the opportunity to build infrastructure. There is absolutely no evidence that they have any idea how they would do that, Mr. Speaker. We we actually have a plan that we're implementing. That plan is part of our budget, Mr. Speaker. And I, you know, I hope, given uh, given uh, what the uh, member opposite has said, that maybe he's looking at our budget once again and is considering supporting parts of our budget. The question, member from Chatham-Kent Essex. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, allow me just a quick moment on behalf of the Ontario PCs. We would again like to express our sincere condolences to the Ford family on the passing of Rob Ford early this morning. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. 21 dogs were seized from a dog fighting ring in my riding, and they've been locked up in cages for over five months while their alleged abusers remain free on bail. I've requested the OSPCA to allow me to see the dogs just to see how well they're doing, but to date, they have not returned my call. The Animal Sanctuary Dog Tales Rescue has offered to take them in immediately as an interim measure at no cost to the province. But they need the minister's help. They require his approval. I understand the minister has a rescue dog just like me and will be visiting dog tails. Speaker, the province can either pay to have these dogs killed or take Question. action and save them at no cost. Only the minister has the power to save these dogs. So, Speaker, to the minister. Thank you. Is the minister willing to provide special designation? Thank you. Uh, Minister, when I stand, you sit. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, again, Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for, for asking uh, this question, and I, I very much appreciate um, um, his, his sincere passion um, on this issue. I think all of us in this House uh, I have an affinity towards protecting the most vulnerable, the pets in our communities, who in many respects are voiceless speaker. Um, and, but speaker, as I've stated before in the House, what the member is asking is about a court process which is underway involving the OSPCA. Uh, we do understand that this is a very challenging issue and many individuals and, and organizations are concerned. But as the member knows, there is currently an application to the court by the OSPCA for permission to euthanize 21 of the 31 pit bull dogs seized from an alleged dog fighting operation, citing risks to public safety. Answer. And, however, Speaker, the remaining dogs are being rehabilitated for relocation outside the province. It's up to the courts to decide, Speaker, as to the next steps. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, back to the minister. Speaker, this government just doesn't get it. Mm. In his responses to questions on this issue, the minister claims he can't do anything. This is unacceptable. Minister, you do have the authority. The Dog Owners Liability Act permits these dogs to be given to a designated body. This could be done without a formal regulation. In other words, your ministry's approval is all that's required. If, you, if, if either one of us were told that our dogs were sick and, we had to be, and they had to be put down, 
I'm sure that we would seek a second opinion. We'd fight to save their lives. These dogs cannot speak for themselves, so I will be their voice. The next court hearing is April 18th, and I'm asking you, Minister, don't leave these dogs in cages for another month. So, Speaker, to the Minister, will you move quickly and grant a special designation to Dog Tales Rescue to give these suffering dogs a second chance at life? Thank you. You see it, please? Thank you. Minister. Well, speaker, again, contrary to the member's assertion uh, and, and public reports, the government of Ontario does not currently have legislative or regulatory authority to direct the OSPCA to take or not take any action or to exempt a private facility from the requirements of the Dog Owners Liability Act for the purposes of transferring ownership of the dogs to such a facility. The OSPCA uh, speaker is an independent charitable organization that provides a number of services, such as animal shelters, veterinary and spray, spay and neuter clinics, and public education about animal welfare. Additionally, speaker, the OSPCA Act authorizes SPCA inspectors and agents to enforce any law pertaining to the welfare of animals. Police may also enforce these laws. There's a reason, Speaker, Answer. that these decisions are being made by the experts who have the capacity under the legislation to make those determinations. It's not up to this legislature or the government to intervene. Thank you. New question, the member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, we learned that the president of the Union Pearson Express, Kathy Haley, is being fired. Her crime, she did what the Premier ordered her to do. We need a history lesson here. Six years ago, the Premier, who was then the Minister of Transportation, ordered Metrolinx to take over the UP Express after the private partner dropped out of the project because they knew it wouldn't make any money. Even so, the Premier ordered Metrolinx to implement the same flawed business model. Kathy Haley was hired a year after the Premier made this decision. Why is the Premier not taking any responsibility for her own bad decision? Minister of Transportation. Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I uh, appreciate the member's question. I'm not, uh, not going to comment on personnel matters, uh, specifically uh, to Metrolinx or any other personnel matters. Uh, I know that these convers, uh, the questions uh, similar to this one came up yesterday, Speaker, regarding the Ian Pearson Express. Uh, what I said yesterday stands. I've had the opportunity to speak with uh, Board Chair Rob Pritchard. I've had the opportunity to work with the Board Chair, Board members and senior staff at Metrolinx now for close to two years. What we are focused on on this side of the House, working closely with Metrolinx, is to make sure that we can deliver on the transit progress that the people of the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area expect. That's the mandate that they gave this Premier. That's the mandate that this Premier has given me. I look forward to continuing Order. to work with Metrolinx to make sure that we deliver on our commitments. Answer. Thanks very much. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, back to the Premier. The original private partner knew that the UP Express could not make money as the exclusive boutique express uh, service for the executive class travellers demanded by this Liberal government. When the private partner dropped out in 2010, the Premier, who was then the Minister of Transportation, could have fixed this problem. She could have changed the UP Express into a true public transit service with affordable fares, more stations and more public access. She could have electrified it from the start. Mr. Speaker. This is is what the public has always demanded and wanted. Instead, she forced Metrolinx to build what her government wanted. Why must Kathy Haley take the blame for the Premier and this Liberal government's bad decision? Uh, thanks very much, Premier. One thing I think it's important to note, uh, just a couple of days ago or a few days ago, we announced in, in, in time for the March break that we were making the fares for the Union Pearson Express more affordable for people who are visiting this region, for people who live in this region. And preliminary numbers and analysis show uh, that since we have made that uh, change to the fares, that ridership has dramatically increased, Speaker, which I think is good news. Which I think is good news. In the first half of her question, the member from Parkdale High Park referenced a history lesson. I think it's most important for people watching, people here in this chamber and watching at home, Speaker, to remember that over the last couple of years at least, as this Premier and our government have put forward plans to build the province up, 
through budgets and other initiatives, the NDP in this chamber have consistently have consistently voted against and resisted every yes, opportunity sir. to support the transit investments that they claim they so desperately want. Speaker, it's unfortunate. Thank you. New question. Member from Glengarry Prescott Russell. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister for Francophone Affairs. I uh, thought I gave him a chance, but the member from Essex will come to order. Carry on, please. Again, my question is for the Minister for Francophone Affairs. On March 20th, Ontario's Francophones, as well as those in, in the country as a whole, celebrated the International Day of Francophonie. In Ontario, there are more than 600,000 francophones. That is 5% of the population. It is the largest francophone population outside of Quebec. Today, Franco-Ontarians can live in French thanks to French access in education, to French uh, ser health services offered in French, as well as, as well as multidisciplinary services offered by cultural organizations. Can the minister explain what the government is doing to support the Francophone community? The minister. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell for his question. I know that he supports the Francophonie and represents a lot of Francophones. I'd like to take this opportunity to wish all Francophones and Francophones a good week of the Francophonie. In this very special week, we can be very happy of the efforts that were done by the government to improve French services. Since 2003, this government has done a lot through several initiatives in order to improve French language services, such as, for example, the creation of the Commissioner for French uh, Language Services. We have, uh, we can think about the 5% uh, Francophone immigration that we've had, the Day for Franco-Ontarians. We can also think about uh, the uh, several schools that have been created for French languages in Ontario, as well as post-secondary education in France in Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Minister for her answer. Mr. Speaker, university is a key element in our province. Indeed, 10% of Francophones in this province are from um, minority groups. We have created different programs to attract qualified workers who wants to who want to come here and settle in Ontario I'd like for the minister to tell us more about the different programs that support the francophone community the minister thank you again to the, the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell and the member is indeed right Ontario is the full ju first jurisdiction working with the Ontario program for kid immigration candidate. It's a first, and we can count on the, our pilot project on French services in uh, the Court of Justice in Ottawa, which brings a better access to the judicial process in French. We can also think about French education from kindergarten to second grade. We have French language programs in six universities across the province, and we also support different um, francophone organizations in the province. They are essential for different fields, for example, health and culture. I'm very proud of the progress that has been made here in Ontario that contributes to the flourishing of our francophone community. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. I'd like to read a quote from the Minister. We aim to make it easier for patients to find a doctor and, from his mandate letter, ensure that every Ontarian has a primary care provider. 
Mr. Speaker, this Liberal government has been in power for 13 years, and yet my riding has two high physician needs communities, Owen Sound and South Bruce Peninsula. The reality that the residents of my communities remain in high physician need and that my constituents have not had access to family doctors is simply inexcusable. Minister, why is your government denying this primary health service to families in my riding? Good question. Thank you, Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. It is a very important issue that we continue to increase the availability of uh, physicians and other health care providers or nurse practitioners, for example, that form part of our primary health care teams, that we make sure that we're increasing access to them. Uh, currently, 94% uh, of Ontarians uh, have such access, which does demonstrate not only how far we've come, that significant improvements since a decade ago, Mr. Speaker, but, and in fact, it's one of the highest in the country, but Mr. Speaker, Speaker, there is more work to be done, and that's part of the reason why I released in December a discussion paper which calls for further reforms to our primary care system, specifically for that reason, so we can go that extra mile, that extra distance for those additional 6 per cent who do want a, a health care provider but are unable to find them. And designation of high-needs area is, uh, areas is as perfect as the uh, member opposite Answer. to the fact that much of his riding is designated high-needs. I'm happy to talk in the supplementary about the benefits of that as well. Yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister, your government has been in charge for 13 years, yet 300 communities remain under service. This is deplorable and an indefensible record. We're talking about the very important work of putting doctors in area of high needs. What's worse, the minister has recently cut off South Bruce Peninsula from the high needs program, denying local families <clears throat> access to doctors. Order. The minister has cut off a community in need, one with a significant burden of poverty, a high proportion of vulnerable, frail seniors, an at risk First Nation population, and a community identified by your own community. Well, that's not helpful at all when you're the one that's complaining that I'm not standing. Well, we've got you on tape. <laughs> and, I, and I don't consider that a challenge to the chair. Finish your question, please. First Nation population and a community identified by your own ministry is under service. This isn't the time to make excuses and talk platitudes. Access to a family physician is not a stretch goal. This is not an extra mile. Given the evidence, the families in South Bruce Peninsula expect your Liberal government question. to reinstate their high needs designation. Minister, will you do that today? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the high needs designation is an extremely important designation. It, for example, it gives access to physicians in a family health team model. In fact, two of his colleagues, the member from Dufferin, Speaker, the member for, for Halliburton, Kawartha, and the member for Chatham, Kent, Essex, will agree with me that just recently, in the past days, both of their uh, significant portions, in the case of Chatham, Kent, Essex, his entire riding has now been designated high needs. Same with the member. From, from Halliburton Quartha. What I would ask the member opposite is, as, the, as his two colleagues have done, is work with me if he's got concerns about designation, if he's got concerns Order. about access yeah. to doctors. But it's rich coming from this party who yeah. fired 9,000 nurses, who closed 28 hospitals, who so disrespected physicians that they were fleeing the province, Mr. Speaker. And so we can't Answer. take lessons from the history that they provide us. Yeah. What we're doing is we're continuing to provide that access. I hope the member opposite would work Thank with you. me to provide access access to his writing. Thank you. No question. The member from Oshawa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Speaker, two weeks ago, I called on the minister to intervene in the OSPCA's application to put down 21 dogs rescued from a dog fighting ring in Tilbury and to spare their lives. Two weeks later, and the courts have denied the application of the dog rescue to rehabilitate these animals, and their lives remain in the minister's hands. Speaker, these dogs should be going to a rescue organization, and the only barrier is the OSPCA court application and the breed-specific legislation that bans them. Will the minister commit to saving these dogs and end the breed-specific ban in Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Community Social Well, Speaker, I mean, this question is already asked, an identical question, and my answer really does not change uh, as well, Speaker. Uh, contrary to the member's uh, assertion, contrary to the public reports, the government does not currently have legislative or regulatory authority to direct the OSPCA to take or not to take any action or to exempt a private facility 
from the requirements of the Dog Owners Liability Act for the purposes of transferring ownership of the dogs to such a facility. Uh, speaker, um, uh, the OSPCA, as we know, is an independent uh, charitable organization that provides a number of services. A lot of, those, lot of those services come as a result of the OSPCA Act that has been passed by this legislation. Uh, speaker, and, and part of that um, legislative requirement is for the SPCA inspectors yes, and agents to enforce any law pertaining to the welfare of animals and of course speaker police could also enforce those laws thank, thank you. you supplementary thank you mr speaker and just to be clear this wasn't a repeat of the same question we are asking for an end to the breed specific ban <laughs> speaker the minister claims that there's nothing he can do but he is the minister responsible for the administration of the ospca act that governs the group seeking to euthanize these sure. dogs. So he does have a say. The breed-specific ban is a provincial ban, and this government is choosing to continue on with this discriminatory legislation. So, Speaker, I will ask again, just to be clear, will the minister end the breed-specific ban and allow animal welfare agencies the chance to rehabilitate these 21 dogs instead of condemning them to die? Thank you, Minister. Uh, speaker, uh, uh, thank you again uh, to the member for the for the question. And I, again, I just want to make sure that that particular piece of legislation uh, uh, has been put in place by this legislature to ensure public safety and security. Uh, and speaker, we have heard of many instances where a particular breed of uh, breed of uh, dogs have uh, resulted in serious injuries to uh, to uh, uh, to children in in particular. Uh, and that speaker, uh, something that of Order, course we please. all take very uh, seriously. In this particular uh, instance, uh, Speaker, uh, as we know that there are currently an application to the court by the OSPCA for permission to euthanize 21 of the 31 pit bull dogs seized from an alleged dog fighting operation, citing risk to public safety. And that is a key, Speaker. One of the reasons why OSPCA is uh, seeking this application because they feel yeah. that 21 of those dogs cite some uh, serious risk to public safety. Uh, and the other dogs the have, been rehab been, uh, rehab be, have been rehabilitated. Uh, but in this Thank particular you. instance, determination may, has been made. Thank you. Hey. Your question, the member from Northumberland, Quinty West. Speaker, Speaker, my question, it, Mr. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Service, and it's not about SPCA. <laughs> Let's be clear. Minister, Minister, yesterday you hosted Minister so for a new strategy for safe Ontario in my community of Coburg. Uh, that's not helpful either, Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Finish, please. Minister, yesterday you hosted a consult consultation for your new strategy for a safer Ontario in my community of Coburg. There, there, we heard passionate ideas from a number of our local community members about how to modernize policing across our province for the 21st century. Many of my community members provided feedback on how policing can be modernized in the 21st century to better serve Ontarians. But, Mr. Speaker, Ontarians across the province and those with us in this legislature here today need to have a further understanding of what this consultation and strategy for a safer Ontario is all about. Question. Speaker, through you to the Minister, please explain the purpose of these consultations. Thank you. Minister Community Safety. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I want to first thank the, the member from Northumberland, Quinty West, uh, uh, for uh, his hospitality yesterday when I was in his community of, uh, of Coburg. Um, we had a, uh, we had a, a very um, um, a fruitful day in terms of uh, visiting the Rebound Child and Youth uh, Center and the incredible work they do in helping at risk youth in Northumberland uh, County. It was encouraging, Speaker, to see the work they're doing. In addition, Speaker, we had the opportunity to meet with uh, 
the chiefs of police from Coburg, police Port Hope, and the OPP uh, detachment commander and, and members of the police services board about the excellent work they're doing in Northumberland uh, County, keeping the community safe. And then we, uh, Speaker, ended the day with, with the consultation on strategy for Safer Ontario at the Coburg Community Centre. Uh, speaker, there was some uh, uh, incredible turnout. In fact, uh, the room was smaller than we, we had Thanks, hoped for. We had to bring more chairs and tables. Wow. And it was great to see the active participation of the community and how can we build a Safer Ontario. And in my Thank supplementary, you. I'll speak to some of those findings. Thank you. Wow. Supplementary. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Minister. Uh, I'm pleased to hear that you are consulting so broadly on this new strategy with a clear focus on evidence-based outcomes. After all, as many of us here today already know, while our police officers work hard every day to keep our community safe, the current model of community safety is no longer sustainable. We need a Made in Ontario approach to community safety that focuses on addressing the problem in our communities, not just from an enforcement perspective, but rather through a more coordinated effort with multiple different types of services. That, may, that way, communities will be able to respond to crime, social issues, in more lasting, cost-effective fashion. Mr. Speaker, through you, can the minister please explain how the strategy for Safer Ontario will improve community for safety outcomes across the province? Absolutely. Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, this is a very exciting time in in in, uh, in the history of uh, of policing in Ontario, as we are looking at ways to modernize and build a 21st century policing uh, in the province of Ontario. In fact, Speaker, this is an opportunity for our province to be a leader in Canada and in North America. Uh, and, and Speaker, the consultations exactly are about that. We want to hear from communities as to how do we ensure that we move away from a reactive enforcement-based model of policing to one that is more uh, proactive and community-focused. How can we ensure that local communities are able to develop community safety and well-being plans? How can we better use, utilize community safety hubs to ensure that our communities are, are safe? Uh, what kind of roles and functions that policing, uh, a 21st century police officer plays, and how can we ensure Speaker, that we're providing the right response at the right time by the right personnel. These are the kind of questions we're asking uh, members of the public. Speaker, we ask them to uh, to join uh, our consultations or go online at ontario.ca slash safer communities for our public consultation document. Thank, Thank you. you. New question, the member from Oxford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of the Environment. As you know, there's a proposal for a landfill in my riding. I know the minister has received thousands and thousands of letters, postcards and emails from my constituents who are concerned about the impact on their drinking water. The mayor of Ingersoll has been very vocal about the fact that our community does not want to take another municipality's garbage, both by going to these municipalities and in speaking to the government at Roma. To make it clear, we are not a willing host. At Roma, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and the Minister of Agriculture stated that a municipality would not be forced to take the garbage if they are not a willing host. Can the minister confirm that this government will not force our community to take another municipality's garbage? Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We, I just want to be very clear about uh, where we are in the process right now, because there's a legal process to ensure we protect the rights of communities, but we also have a fair process for citing landfills. And I think we'd all appreciate that it's not a matter of uh, taking other people's garbage. We have a system in Ontario where, where we share those burdens of disposal. What, what has been approved is a terms of reference that the proponents in this case have to follow. And as we go through this process, Mr. Speaker, Order. all aspects are looked at. Detailed studies are done on risks to water supplies, opportunities. And the member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke come to order. Finish, please. Thank you very much. So it's an evidence-based, public, transparent process. And Mr. Speaker, I wrote into the amend amendment for the terms of reference that we have to consider cumulative effects. Answer. I think there was some confusion there because that actually it includes human health effects. I just want to be very clear on the record. We the member from Leeds, health, Grenville. We don't have a health category, thank you. but that's included in cumulative. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Minister. As you know, the people in my community are worried. 
not just about where the garbage could come from, but the risk to our drinking water of a landfill located on fractured bedrock near the Thames River and one of Ingersoll's main municipal water supplies. They're concerned that this government doesn't get it. Today is World Water Day, and to mark this occasion, the people of my riding are looking for a commitment from the Minister of the Environment. Can the Minister give us his insurance that the landfill will not be approved if it, is put on our, if it puts our drinking water at risk? Thank you. Minister? Mr. Speaker, the short answer is yes. And that's what the terms of reference policy is. And now, while I have great respect for the member from Oxford, he's been a friend, and I think we have worked well together on these issues, and I, I know he and I share a concern. I would even go further, Mr. Speaker. I would say that Oxford County is one of the leading counties, if not the leading county in Ontario, on environmental sustainability, zero waste, and low carbon. This is a remarkable community with a remarkable environmental group. So we are very concerned because there are not that many communities. Each of us as MPPs would, find, would not put in our election literature that we're running for re-election by putting uh, a waste facility in our communities. It is one of the more difficult decisions. So we want to make sure that we're, the standards are some of the highest. I commit to work with your community, with your mayor, and with yourself to ensure that if the decision in Answer. the end is to cite a dump there, that it meets every single standard, and I think we put in place Thank you. with cumulative effects the highest standard possible. Thank you. New question, the member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Speaker, children and families across the province continue to inundate my office expressing concerns that provincial and demonstration schools may be forced to close. Students who have had positive life-changing experiences are coming forward, sharing their stories. Parents have seen their children grow, thrive and succeed. Experts in the sector have spoken publicly about the value of these schools. Even pediatricians are coming forward. These schools help our most vulnerable kids. Some children, particularly those who thrive in ASL or QSL environments, will be left with no other local alternatives. My question is clear. Will the Minister of Education ensure that no provincial or demonstration school is closed as a result of consultation? Yes or no? Yes, and uh, of course, as we've said many times, uh, no decisions have been made. The consultation is continuing, and we really uh, do need to think about how do we best serve our children with special needs. We know that um, the the children that the children who are in the demonstration schools are served very well by the demonstration schools. Nobody is arguing that that uh, they have very good programs, but what we are looking at is the, the availability of those programs, the accessibility of those programs, and we, we are reviewing the demonstration schools, and I want to assure people that that review will happen as quickly as possible, but we do want to hear from everyone involved, and no decisions have been made at this point. Answer. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. These are critical programs for students uh, that go to the provincial and the demonstration schools, as the minister herself has acknowledged. So perhaps she should lift the caps on enrollment and reopen enrollment rather than keeping it closed. Right? Speaker, it was a yes or no question. Even though the minister herself continually rises in this House and speaks with certainty about the positive impacts of these schools, it is clear that the government will not commit to keeping these specialized schools open. On this side of the House, we believe that all children deserve equal access to education that allows them to thrive. If families want to benefit from these schools, they should have every right to do so. This government should, be, should not be balancing the books on the backs of vulnerable children and families. I'll ask again, will the minister tell concerned families today that no provincial Christian. or demonstration school will be closed as a result of consultation? Thank you, Minister. Yes, and I, I think the, uh, the, the, the member opposite in her question actually hit on the issue here, is that we believe in equal access for all students with special needs. So we are committed 
to reviewing special education programs and making sure that, in fact, we are meeting the needs of special education students. Not, as she said, locally, and uh, these aren't local schools, they're schools where people fly in from, literally fly in. Uh, from around from around the province, we need to look at what is the availability of programs in all boards throughout the province, in all regions throughout the province. What's the availability yes, of programming for children with very severe learning disabilities? That's what we're having. Thank to you. Look at, is equal access. Thank you. New question. The member from York Southwestern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Training Colleges and uh, Universities. Ontario's apprenticeship system is a key part of building the highly skilled workforce our province needs to compete in today's global economy. Many constituents in my riding of York Southwest and often ask me about the different ways our government is supporting people entering the skilled trades in Ontario. I understand that the minister recently was at George Brown College to announce additional funding in two apprenticeship programs that will help the next generation of skilled tradespeople access the training, equipment and facilities they need to get high-quality jobs. Some of my constituents are particularly interested to know how how this funding will help those who face barriers to start an apprenticeship, access promising careers in the skilled trades. Speaker, could the minister please inform the members of the House how this funding will help people access apprenticeship programs in the province of Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Training, College and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from York Southwestern for that very timely question, Mr. Speaker. I just recently visited George Brown College to announce that our government is investing $36 million in two apprenticeship programs as part of Ontario's renewed new job strategy. We are investing, Mr. Speaker, $23 million over two years in the Apprenticeship Enhancement Fund and $30 million in Ontario's pre-apprenticeship program. One example is the Central Ontario Building Trades Hammer, Hammerheads program, Mr. Speaker, which is an excellent program, Mr. Speaker, which provides life-changing training opportunities to youth. Mr. Speaker, our government will continue building Ontario up by ensuring our people have the skills to get good jobs. Mr. Speaker, I want to take this moment to thank all instructors in our 68 training centres run by our colleges and the union and uh, employee-based uh, training centres. I want to thank the uh, instructors, junior thank persons you. and the mentors for the good work they Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that answer. It is reassuring to know that our government is committed to helping people access apprenticeship programs in the province of Ontario. And the Hammerheads program is a tremendous program. They operate in my writing and they've helped many young people. Many of my constituents who are new to Canada often tell me that they face challenges in finding good jobs, Mr. Speaker, because they lack the training and the experience to work in the skilled trades in our province. I understand that one of the minister's priorities is to support newcomers to Canada and to apprenticeship programs. Uh, speaker, could the minister please inform the members of this house on the progress that he and his ministry are making in helping new Canadians through Ontario's pre apprenticeship Question. program? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, Mr. Speaker, the hardworking member from York Southwestern is absolutely right, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, almost one in five new jobs in Ontario over this decade is expected to be in trades-related occupations. And I am pleased to say that Ontario's pre-apprenticeship training program is funding projects that will support newcomers to Canada and to Ontario to access apprenticeship programs. I am proud to say that, Mr. Speaker, Order. this year we are in investing nearly $3 million towards a 13 pre apprenticeship program that will help new Canadians into the skill trades. Mr. Creek. Speaker, our government will continue investing in our people by supporting a high-quality skill trades and apprenticeship system in our province of Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Energy. Speaker, last week a wind project was awarded to Inver Energy in Dutton-Dunwich. 
even though this municipality is not a willing host. In fact, 84 per cent of the residents of Dutton Dunwich voted against this wind project. Speaker, another municipality in my riding, Malahide, was a willing host, but was not awarded a contract. Speaker, this government has stated that municipalities will have a say on wind projects. However, in this latest round of contracts, this does not seem to be the case. Speaker, will the minister explain to the municipalities in my riding why they are ignoring their voices? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, we have a process for large renewable uh, procurements, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that was consulted very broadly across the province of Ontario, including with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, AMO, with individual municipalities. Uh, we produced a handbook for municipalities and distributed to every municipality in the province, Mr. Speaker, setting out what the process was. It was very clear that no municipality would have a veto. But it did require the proponents, Mr. Speaker, to have a very, very broad engagement uh, with the uh, municipalities, provided incentives for them to, uh, to have agreements with municipalities, Mr. Speaker. Of 16 contracts awarded, Mr. Speaker, 13 of them had willing host communities. Ah. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, back, back to the minister. Speaker, uh, even your own words back in test. Speaker, uh, back in using a testimony from the minister and committee in November of 2013, he said municipalities wouldn't be given a veto of projects, but it would be very rare indeed for any to be approved without municipal backing. It would be almost impossible for somebody to win one of those bidding processes without engagement with the municipality. Speaker, either the ministry, minister doesn't know what's going on in his ministry, or he just wasn't telling the truth in committee. Speaker, will the minister? Member was withdrawn. I withdraw, Speaker. Speaker, will the minister keep his word and stop the contract from coming to Dutton Dunwich? Yeah. Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, there was very significant engagement in this particular file, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have uh, a quote here from uh, Lori Spence Bannerman, CAO of Dutton Dunwich, uh, who recognized, Mr. Mr. Speaker, the efforts of the company to set up a monthly uh, meeting with the working group. Quote, the wind energy company has to show that they're doing things to engage the community, and so they were hosting regular monthly meetings. A working group is one of those things that shows that you're engaging the local community, Mr. Speaker. That quote is from Lori uh, Spence Bannerman, CAO of Dutton Dunwich, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Toronto Councillor and former Mayor Rob Ford passed away this morning uh, following a hard fought battle against cancer. This House sends its condolences to his wife, his children, and loved ones as a sign that the entire province mourns the loss of Rob Ford. I believe you'll find we have unanimous consent to observe a moment of silence. The Leader of the Opposition is seeking unanimous consent to. Uh to, create, uh, to do a moment of silence uh, for the passing of Rob Ford. Do we agree? I would ask all members to please rise and observe a moment of silence. Kind gesture. We have a deferred vote on the motion that this House approves in general the budgetary policy of the government. Calling the members, this will be a five minute bell.
all members please take their seats. All members, please take your seats. Please. I wonder if there's a competition to see who's the last to sit. I can't figure that one out. On February 25, 2016, Mr. Sousa moved second, uh, uh, seconded by Ms. Wynn that this House approves in general the budgetary policy of the government. All those in favour, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Napier. Mr. Napier. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. 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 Mr.